All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start off um, recording this one from home, so the surroundings look just a little different. Um, but we're starting off into our second unit, um, which is going to be stoichiometry. Now, learning goal for this part of the unit, we need to know how, or be able to note, how are atoms of the same element different from each other, and how do we actually show it? Now, I do realize now that's supposed to be a, a question mark, but please forgive me. I'll just go ahead and write it in right there. All right, now, let's go ahead and get started. We want to look at element symbols overall. Now, this should start to look familiar. This is the basic information that we're using when we did our atoms worksheet the other day. First off, we have the element symbol represented by X. This is, again, based on what we have on our periodic table. The charge, if there is a charge, it's going to be zero if blank, but if it is an ion, we'll have the charge there located. Coming down to the right side, the bottom right here, we have the number of atoms there are if we're looking at a formula. Um, coming over to the bottom left, we have the atomic number, again, from our periodic table. This should match up with the element symbol that we have. And the mass number, which is going to be the number of protons and neutrons. Now, here's an example where we can sort of use. We have oxygen, and this is how I would write the information if I'm dealing with oxygen, especially in its ionic form. Um, but again, we have some uh, practice with this, so we'll move ahead into where we actually use and see this a lot, which is going to be isotopes. Now, first thing we have to figure out is, what is an isotope? This is going to be an atom of the same element, but it's going to differ by the number of neutrons. Now, remember, we change the number of protons, we change the element, so we're not going there. If we change the number of electrons, we're going to change the charge. But if we change the number of neutrons, all we're going to do is we're still dealing with the same element, but we're going to change the possible stability of that atom. Now, there are some that are radioactive, and there's a lot of uh, research going into um, nuclear chemistry and, and seeing how it can be used in different fields. But the majority of the atoms that we're going to deal with, the isotopes are fairly stable. Now, here's an example. If I'm looking at hydrogen, you notice that both of them still have our hydrogen because they both have one proton. But the difference here is if we look at hydrogen one, we have one mass number, I mean one as the mass number, whereas here we have two as the mass number. Again, because we now have a neutron located right here inside of the nucleus. So this is my neutron. Now, this changes the overall mass number, so I have hydrogen 1, hydrogen 2. Now, how can we identify them? The way that we can identify them is two main ways, or see that you, you'll see them written. One as a nuclide symbol, the other one as hyphen notation. The nuclide symbol looks just like this. You're given the element symbol, just as we have it here, and it has the mass number written here at the top right. Now, what if we move forward? Sorry. We can also write in hyphen notation by writing the mass number after. So carbon hyphen 12 or carbon hyphen 13. We just say carbon 13 or carbon 12. This, uh, these are the main two ways that we'll use when dealing with naming or identifying isotopes. The key here is we want to make sure that the same number of protons, same atomic number, and the same symbol. The mass number, if it changes, we can tell which ones are neutron or are isotopes. Now, we want to look at the difference between the atomic mass and mass number. And there's a couple of different things that we're going to look at here. One, mass number again, just by what we had on the number of protons and neutrons, whereas the, ma the average atomic mass, sorry, is the average actual masses, as if we could put them on a balance. Mass number, whole number, whereas average atomic mass, not going to be a whole number. Um, mass number directly for or specific to the isotope that atom of the isotope, whereas the weighted average has to cover all of the isotopes of that element. And the easiest one to differentiate between, if we look at the mass number, it's not going to be found on the periodic table, whereas the average atomic mass is that number given to us as the atomic mass on the periodic table. Now, how do we actually calculate this average atomic mass? We're going to use this formula to figure it out. Now, you notice that it's going to be called a weighted average. Why do you think it's called a weighted average? Well, the biggest thing we have to look at is how often does each isotope occur? 
if I have uh, carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14, unfortunately I can't look at it and say, okay, they all are different masses, but they all occur in the same amounts. Carbon 12, if we look at our average atomic mass overall, 12.01, is it seems like everything's much, much closer. And that's because a large percentage of the carbon that we deal with on a regular basis or the samples that we take are actually carbon 12. The other ones um, are even less than possibly 10%, sometimes even less than 1% of the time that you actually find it. Now, look at our formula here at the bottom of, of the screen. We have our average atomic mass equals the sum of the abundance of the isotope, how often it occurs, times the mass of the isotope, the actual mass, not the mass number. Sometimes you'll be given the mass number, sometimes you'll be given the actual mass. Um, if you're given the mass number, use just the mass number. If you're given the actual mass, then make sure you use the actual mass. Now, let's take a look at one example of how we could actually take this into account. If we were to use this, looking at this example here, this is the information I'm actually pulling from the problem. We have two different isotopes of chlorine, carbon, uh, chlorine 35 and chlorine, chlorine 37. We're given their masses as 34.969 and 36.966. And the percentage is given to us. Now, first, we're only given 24.22%. But since we only have two, that means all we have to do is subtract that from 100 to get our next abundance of 75.78. Now, go back to our formula. How will we set it up? Well, the relative abundance times the mass. So 34.969 times 0 0.07578. And add that to what you'll get from the product of 36.966 times 0.2422. Once we've taken this and added it up, we're going to get 35.45 AMU. Now, you may be thinking in your head, okay, Mr. Baldwin, we had actual percentages. Why is it now that we're dealing with these decimals? All we did is take the relative abundance out of the percentage form by dividing it by 100 and then use that to multiply. This will give us an actual uh, closer amount and weighted amount um, for what we're dealing with here and allow us to still get an answer that should be right in line with what we have. Now, your key here, you want to make sure your answer should be somewhere between the two or more values that you have. So, looking at this, my answer should have been between 34 and, 35, and 36. So, I can actually look at this and say, okay, it matches up, I'm good to go everything is fine. Now, what we're going to do in class is we're going to take a little bit more time we're going to go through this and we have to apply it to the next part which is dealing with um, mass spectrometry and how we actually read um, a mass spec um, sheet or reading. Take a few moments, look at this, pause, rewind if you need to, and I will see you in class tomorrow. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.